Today we're going to be talking about imperialism in Japan. We've been talking about how Europe has gone out and imperialized parts of Africa. Previous to that, they were in the New World in South America, North America. They've gone into India and Southeast Asia. We even talked a little bit about China. But now we're going to talk about Japan and the role that they play in imperialism. Before we start talking, though, about imperialism in Japan, we need to talk first about how Japan has been dealing with this problem of foreigners up until this point, because this is not the first time that Europeans are going to come into Japan. Going back to the end of ninth grade, you'll remember that Japan had gone into a policy of isolation under what was known as a Tokugawa shogunate. Because these Europeans were coming in and trying to force their ways onto the Japanese, they basically had closed all of their borders. Do you remember how the shogunate worked? For those of you who maybe don't remember, a shogunate was the idea of Japanese feudalism. At the top was the emperor. The emperor was a god, but he really didn't have any kind of political power. He was more of a figurehead. The true leader under the Japanese shogunate was the shogun, the head of the Japanese military. He then gave land to his daimyo, or his generals, in return for their military service and loyalty. The daimyo then divvied out that land to his samurai, his, his military, his foot soldiers, um, in return for their military service. This is similar to knights under European feudalism. Below that are peasants and artisans, and at the very bottom are the merchants. So let's talk now about how the Europeans are going to come into Japan in the second wave of imperialism after the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s. The first to come to Japan was actually a, um, a person from the U.S. In 1853, Commodore Matthew Perry came to Japan to in an attempt to open up um, trade, but also as a place to refuel their ships. The U.S had been imperializing in um, in parts of Southeast Asia and needed a place to stop and gain supplies or to refuel on their way from uh, California and the West Coast as they were coming into Southeast Asia. Now Perry comes with four small ships and it's not this Matthew Perry, but a different Matthew Perry. And he comes with these four small ships and a letter from President Fillmore asking for Japan to open up their ports to these um, these U.S. naval ships. Now, Fillmore in the letter was very, um, very kind, nice, basically asking. Perry, not so much. Perry basically comes in and says, look, here's this letter. Um, the president's being nice, but I'm not going to be. You have one year to decide whether or not you're going to open your ports. If not, when I come back, it's not going to be with four small ships, but with many more larger ships. And we will basically force you to open your ports. So he returns a year later in 1854 and forces Japan to sign a treaty opening their ports. Other Western nations, European nations, uh, soon follow. Needless to say, the Japanese, who are a very honorable people, were not happy that the Japanese leaders would sign something that was so degrading to the Japanese people. So, in 1868, rebels force the shogun to step down. And they decide that they're no longer going to have a shogun who is the leader of their, their government, but instead they're going to restore the emperor, which is why this is called the Meiji Restoration. They're restoring the emperor as their leader. In this case, it's Emperor Musashido. And he starts a period of Meiji. This means enlightened rule. Again, this is where we get the name, the Meiji Restoration. Now, Musashido was actually really uh, smart when it came to how they were going to deal with these Europeans and these um, people from the U.S. He realized that the only way to get rid of the Westerners was to become more like the Westerners. Because 
if the Westerners saw the Japanese as being equals, they would be less likely to imperialize them. Because remember that one of the social causes for imperialism is this idea that these Westerners had to westernize, modernize, Christianize, the idea of social Darwinism and the white man's burden. But he figured out that if they saw them as being equals, that wouldn't come into play. So he came up with this, if you can't beat them, join them kind of mentality. And he sent people to study in the West. And Japan changed quite a bit due to his rule. So first, end of feudalism. By this point in time, feudalism is done in Europe. And he realized that in order to be a modern society, you can't have an agriculturally based um, society, which is what feudalism is. So there's the end of feudalism. He sent people abroad to learn about the West. He gained a, um, or modeled their constitution after that of Germany. And he started to modernize their armed forces. At this point in time, people like the Westerners, the Europeans, are using guns. They're using um, modern weapons. But the samurai, which is their main um, defense, are using swords. And they realize that they have to modernize their armed forces. So they look to the British and the Germans and model their military after those. This is sort of the end, the beginning of the end for the samurai. Um, their education system. Many people went to the U.S. to places like California and were educated in the U.S. Um, and because they adopted this Western technology, in less than 50 years, they became an industrialized society. But here's the problem. Japan does not have the natural resources like places like Britain did to become um, industrialized. So, in order to in industrialize and get these natural, uh, natural resources, these raw materials, they had to become imperialistic. This is very important. They have to go outside their borders to get these natural resources. But it also solves another problem. The West is not going to come in and imperialize you if you are going out and imperializing others. So, Japan goes out and starts to try to take over um, and establish their own colony, starting basically in their own backyard. They start in Asia. They wanted an overseas empire. In 1876, they force Korea, which is their closest neighbor, to open up three ports. Now, China and Japan had been using Korea as sort of a cultural bridge for centuries. But now they wanted to use them not just as a cultural bridge, but for their natural resources. But again, here's the problem. China uses Korea as well. And so Japan and China sign a sort of a hands-off agreement that they'll both leave Korea alone. But this doesn't last very long. In 1894, Korea is going through some issues. And the Korea, Korea's king asks China for some military help. And um, China sends in their military. This breaks that hands-off agreement. So Japan sends troops to fight the Chinese in 1895. This is known as the Sino-Japanese War. Sino meaning Chinese. And Japan actually beats the Chinese and they gained Formosa, or what is now known as Taiwan. Now the Sino-Japanese War changed the balance of power. Um, you start to see a shift in uh, who is going to be the most powerful nation in, uh, in Asia. So now Japan and Russia are the most powerful nations in Asia. And so now you see the two, Japan and Russia, starting to fight over um, colonies and natural resources. In 1903, Japan agreed to recognize Russia's rights in Manchuria, which is sort of the northern part of modern-day China. So they said Russia could stay in Manchuria if the Russians then stayed out of Korea. Um, 
the Russians refused. And in 1904, Japan launches a surprise attack on some Russian ships off the coast of Manchuria. Not only do the Japanese win, they drive the Russians out of Korea and capture their Pacific fleet. In 1905, they make the Treaty of Portsmouth, which was actually um, drafted in part by Theodore Roosevelt. This gave Japan captured territories and forced Russia to withdraw from Manchuria and stay out of Korea. So now Japan has, through these two wars, established themselves as the most powerful nation in Asia. And this is saying a lot because you have teeny tiny Japan up against big bad Russia and big bad China and they lose um, to this tiny little nation. So now Japan has established themselves as a military power, but they're also benefiting from expansion. They're able to compete with the West, and they're getting that really important raw materials from um, their new colonies. So going back to Korea for a minute, um, after the Russo-Japanese War, when the Russians were forced to stay out of Korea, Japan actually took on Korea as what's known as a protectorate. And a protectorate is more or less when a strong state protects and controls a weaker state. They're not fully annexing them, that is like adding them to their, uh, their country, but they're in control of them. In 1907, they forced the Korean king to give up control. And this is when, in 1910, Japan actually annexes or added the territory of Korea Japan. Now, under the Japanese rule of Korea, things were not nice for the Koreans. The Japanese were very harsh rulers. They replaced the Korean language and the uh, Korean uh, education system with Japanese. Everyone was required to speak Chinese, or, excuse me, Japanese. Um, they even forced the Koreans to change their names from Korean names to Japanese names. They took away their land and the Koreans were not allowed to start or own any kind of business. So, the Japanese during this time period, the biggest thing that you need to remember is this movement from being sort of an agricultural society under feudalism, under a policy of isolation, and basically being threatened to be imperialized, to becoming a modern, imperialistic, militaristic kind of nation. So when you remember the Meiji, remember that Japan modernized. Thank you.